So hello, um, good evening in London. It's 6 p.m. in London, and that means that it's 12 noon in Chicago. Thank you for tuning in on YouTube. We're streaming this live on the Bartlett School of Architecture YouTube channel. This is the series around the bee world in eight hours with Sir Peter Cook. And this evening, we're delighted to have Jeannie Gang with us from Studio Gang in um, Chicago. Um, Jeannie is um, a professor of practice at Harvard and um, a very notable architect. And Peter this evening is going to, first of all, introduce some of her work, followed by a short discussion and then a short presentation. And then that will be opened out to questions, um, both within the audience here, within the Zoom audience, but also within um, the YouTube live streaming. So please ask questions as you come. And this talk series has evolved out of talks that were um, being developed with our first years and Bob Sheel and Barbara Campbell Lang asked if this could be upscaled. So um, thank you for joining us. I'm now going to hand over to Peter. Hi, good evening. Good morning. Good lunchtime, rather. <clears throat> uh, actually, you know, compared with most of the people I've been talking to so far in this series, I've known you the least long, but on the two or three times that I have met you, you've been very, very amusing and good company and, and quite different from what I originally thought you might be. Oh, really? <laughs> you know, this very successful Chicago person. I always think of Chicago as a hard town. I thought, God, she's going to be a real hard lady. Quite the reverse. You're a real nice, jolly, but obviously very, very talented person. And I think you do stuff that a lot of people would wonder how the hell you do it within, I'm not saying commercial exactly, but within a successful situation, building really the kinds of buildings that usually are thought of as big boys toys, for one, <laughs> and, and doing them so, so fluently. But, you know, obviously behind the fluency is a, clearly a very good brain working as well as you as a charming person so what well, i'm following thank you very much uh about a week ago a big one of these you know everything comes in big boxes all the time i sit in the room looking at big boxes coming in and out and one of them was your new book uh, with rizzoli i think that's right isn't it is it rizzoli uh, fine 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 oh, sorry <laughs> <laughs> okay, your big fighting book. And um, I have followed you, your book. I followed the themes that you erected for the book because you did, you make it very clear the, the key kind of thrusts of certain projects. Although, as you do say later in the book, <clears throat> some of them obviously overlap, but, but this, this breaking it down into followable themes i think it's very useful so the first one you have is called rhythm and you have you know you recall mybridge from the 19th century and his early photographs and how this creates a rhythm for these boat houses which also have a very the rhythm is seen very much in silhouette and, and funnily enough this morning we were talking with Wang Chu, and one of his buildings that we were homing in on, you probably know it, is the one where the, the rhythm of the roofs is responding to the mountain. So it's almost it was carrying on that same conversation from this morning. And in Hyde Park, which I guess is a Chicago Hyde Park, you, you almost yeah. seem to pull the rhythm sideways. So it's, it's a kind of undulation happening along the grain of the building. Now, I think for me, one of the interesting things about what you do is, is, its, is its fluency with skin and perimeter. I mean, many architects, even those who do interesting buildings, sort of tentatively move their way around the, the periphery of the building. Not you, you have you've somehow grasped matter and structure and you just jolly along actually I mean, that's, that's not to make it too slight uh, and then very interesting i think of these diagrams where you 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 make it explicit how you're drawing the building you're making this rhythm 
part of a trajectory and then twisting the trajectories. It's, it's difficult stuff and you seem to pull it off remarkably. Now, I can't help being a bit naughty and saying, well, chicken <laughs> egg, I don't know. I, actually, because one looks at the New York building of Frank Gehry, it's much more staccato. You don't, you tend not to play the staccato game. You are concerned to have the continuity. Once you've set up your rhythm, it, it, it runs, it runs, it runs. Uh, but what is Frank doing there for Santa Monica? Uh, because there's a difference between the New York building and the Santa Monica one. Is he is he looking at you? We like to ask. Uh, anyhow, I couldn't resist that because you know, just as 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 one was with Wang Chu looking for other architects in the world who use certain kinds of materiality. I think I think all of you guys are very original to yourselves, but there I always feel that there are things in the wind. At a certain moment in history, there are things in the wind. Now, flow, you're still talking about flow, but here the flow is is very organic. And I look at that plan and I see a periphery, which is fairly, which and of course this is an institutional building. This is, this is going to be a museum. Uh, and it's, it's hugging, I guess, within other buildings but then you carve it out like a cave. And that's tricky stuff because it's not, you're not making your flow happen, rolling around an object, you're digging, digging into, you're being a giant mole. And there is a certain precedent for this, which is not necessarily a fashionable precedent. And so I'm intrigued by that, though with digital, support obviously you could do things which perhaps these guys had to do with great effort but i'm intrigued that, that it reminds me a bit of the goethe name and you were telling me the other day that in fact you you know the goethe name and you visited i'm not saying you mm -hmm. <laughs> pick straight up but but it's somehow as if you're 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 playing with fire of of going to a kind of architecture that it's certainly not typical Chicago, but I'll come back to that later. And then I think this is an intriguing one where you where you show the thing more as a straightforward organization, as you can see that it's a straightforward organization, and then you drape the sculpted cave into it. I think that's a your 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 sketch references, your drawing references are always a very, very interesting, very, very useful for the observer as they are here. Now this was the thing that really I think from an outside point of view put you on the map. I said what's that? That's really rather juicy. What? Is somebody, is it real? And and first time I saw that photograph I thought it couldn't have been built. And when you came to the market a year or so back whenever it was uh, you gave very very good description of it and you explained at great length how these undulations were in fact balconies and how these balconies could enable people on different levels to communicate with each other. It wasn't just flim flam, it wasn't just sort of <laughs> waltzing around. Although I think the the compositional aspect of it, the, the art, I mean straightforward art decisions. Why not have art decisions, you know? And and Here's, here's your, almost like a score for a piece of music, you know, as if you're writing within a certain key and you're allowing the, the, mm -hmm. the various modulations. Okay, and there it is again. Now what intrigued me, I've just taken out of the context of your, out of the sequence of your book slightly, where you refer to Manhattan Henge with reference to the museum. But here I'm also fascinated by when one sees Chicago, your very evocative building sits in this sort of tough, hard atmosphere that I always feel from Chicago. Whereas in looking at Manhattan, you're almost claiming for it uh, a, a, a slightly more 
eccentric, more magical thing. So I'd be interested to hear your views on the differences between Chicago and New York, uh, if, if, if you wish. Mm -hmm. And then Flo, this building uh, in your lecture to the Bartlett, I remember you, you, you described um, its operation as its three-way views and so on. But what I'm particularly interested in, if I dare, is how you, how you manipulate it. Now, you have said on several occasions that you're really interested in material. I seem to remember that these are end on logs in some strange uh, constructional process. And then you do naughty sort of cleavages in amongst them. <laughs> strange cleavages and strange holes running through. It's again, um, not your, not the gambit of the high rises. This is something very different. Not, you're almost making a cave in order to carve a cave into it or something. This is a, this is, the mole is back again in some <laughs> Uh, and you use the term towards terrestrial, which I think you said the other day is, is to do with ground, is it having to do with things that go on amongst people in the ground. And this is, this could, this will, I mean, <clears throat> the kind of uh, tone of the scene, and the, the building is in the background, we'll look at it in a minute, but the tone of the scene looks almost European. <laughs> it, it, look, it has that slightly fancy uh, feel of a, of a some European event, maybe in a in a French wedding or something. I don't know quite what it is. I, I would never think it was Chicago, except for the giveaway in in at the back there. Uh, and beautiful technique. I mean, there are people around the world doing this kind of thing, but I think not not many as elegantly and as assuredly. You're really very assured on on on. Excuse me. And I'm sure the Arkansas Cultural Center, if, if and when it's built, will have that same elegance, I sniff so. But what I'm really interested in too is, is the picture on the right. Because it's always been fascinating to me who uses models in the, in the work and who doesn't. I remember some years ago, there was an exhibition of Herzog de Meuron at the Tate Modern. And what was fascinating was how the, the lead ups looked almost like a really interesting architecture school. People make all sorts of different placements. Or if, if, if you go to, say, um, Sanan's office, it's just full of, of models, many of them incomplete and flopping around that, that you have clearly, I would imagine, all the, you know, the digital skills and apparatus and so on and so on and so on mathematics but digging around poking around and manipulating particularly in very much ground-based buildings i think is something that clearly I, I i think is the way to do it now your own office um i suppose is an experiment in how it would be nice for all offices to be you know why aren't all offices with a, with a very agreeable <laughs> private world on their roof? Uh, maybe you're going to say something like that. And of roofs, you're clearly fascinated. You, you have this, uh, again, lead-in reference called Up in the Canopy. And then you because you're so interested in materials, it looks like this is made for a party, I think, yeah? And yeah, it's a summer party. Mm -hmm. Summer party. And uh, why not use a party to, to experiment with rather than just a sort of decorations, quote unquote. The, the capturing of light um, is something that I think is very interesting in these two buildings. Um, but you don't just modulate, but you modulate to an effect, to, a, to, a, to capture something of, of the sun or the light as it passes through a building. And uh, the right-hand building 
is in fact a corner of a larger building which is off the picture uh, and that must mean that the guys who work around that corner have a very very special experience perhaps not shared by even the rest of the building but never mind and and i'm intrigued by that that, that it's something which i think mod modernism lost completely uh, and i'm you know it's great that guys like you are trying to do it mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm sad when you told me the other day that actually the French aren't going to build your one. Mm. Uh, I, I, you know, uh, I remember also Tom Main's wonderful tower for Paris. They didn't build that. They seem to block out when you, you real talented guys from outside try and mosey into the Paris scene. And it is a bitch, the existing building. I mean, look at it, that lump on the right. I mean, mm. it, it's, I, I used to, uh, teach just around the corner from there for some time and it it's mm. a killer yours would have been love I mean, if you could have got that uh, and, and you would have done because you've got such a track record in, in dealing with skin that it would have been beautiful well i want to finish up as <laughs> chicago girl here's you're gonna you're almost beating the boys at their own game you know and and <laughs> But I was intrigued in reading about Stanley and having met him sometimes as an extraordinary character and Bertrand Goldberg to these two guys who were not part of the Mies school. They didn't play the Mies game. And certainly for my generation, the generation actually before mine, all these guys used to leave the A and go and work, try and work for Mies. And if they couldn't work for Mies, they worked for Skidmore, who was doing sort of Mies at the time. And that was what Chicago was about. And Stanley in particular fought against that. And you were, you know, he refers to you and you refer to him that, that, that you were naughty. You're in, this, in the train of the naughty guys from Chicago. <laughs> But you are very much of Chicago, despite a, a, a good spell at Omar in Rotterdam and, and you know, going to Harvard and all that, you are still of Chicago, feeding back into Chicago, but giving it a good, I was going to say kick in the bum, but it's something more, for, I don't know what the word to use is. I think at, at this point, <laughs> I knew the <laughs> plot, I, I, over to you. Peter, and uh... I could just listen to you talk about architecture all day, I think. And it's just a special treat that you're speaking about my work and our work at Studio Gang. Um, and it's really nice to be here with everyone from even from so far away. Um, I thought I would just maybe jump right into um, a project and out, out of those from um, the book and the one that seems the that i'd like to talk about now and i'll share my screen hold on i think i can do that um there we go um this is is that centered for everyone yeah that's great we can see that thanks Perfect. Okay. So um, the, this is such an interesting building and it is currently under construction, the Gilder Center for Science, Education, Innovation at the American Museum of Natural History. And it, it has the, the Museum of Natural History has a special place in my heart because of my interest in nature and the, the, the way that it works, the way that um, um, there are logics found in nature that can be very much applied to architecture and but it also crosses over a lot of other things for me one of them um, being this idea of the the building that has almost no outside it's it's really um as peter sh showed hold on i think i'm gonna click this way um it's it's really an any building it's an any building because it's on this campus full of already 25 different buildings that were uh, built up over time. And you can see in this image, uh, the different um, 
eras and the yellow dot is where the new wing of the Gilder Center will be. And you can see on the left under construction, the Theodore uh, Roosevelt um, Memorial, which is a wing, the main entrance of Central Park West, where there is a statue that was that uh, recently it was just requested by the president of the uh, museum to remove the statue of Theodore Roosevelt be because of the way that it depicts um, the other races. It had, there, there's a picture, it's a statue of Theodore Roosevelt on a big horse and to his right and to his left, there is a Native American and an African American that are clearly depicted as you know subservient to this great hero on the horse. So it, it, it was, um, you know, the depiction that was causing this um, angst. So it, it also in a way crosses over with other parts of our work where we've been interested in um, how do you make a public space where um, it, that is more inclusive and not um, um, just honoring, you know, one particular type of person, but but is more inclusive. And so some of our work is also in the realm of cities. Um, so there, I think it's an interesting crossover, very, very recent um, thing about that. And um, I want to just talk a little bit about our ideas for this project. Um, you can see there are many different kinds of architecture here. And, and one of the things that uh, we discovered, and we, this was a competition, um, was in this maze, if you've ever been here, this maze of galleries, uh, um, there's very little ability for the visitor to tell where they are. You kind of get totally lost, which can be fun also, but it can be frustrating for visitors. And so uh, the site that was given was, you know, anywhere over here. <laughs> and, and But what we found was by um, really analyzing what was already there, we thought that with a few edits, we could clarify this overall circulation in the, the pink area and, and bring this addition in way into the depth of the, the building and make almost 30 different connections in the circulation for visitors. Um, this is the former powerhouse for the museum. And now it's um, part of their, their museum as well. So this, this um, second challenge of the project was to, to really um, address the issue of, of science in the American system. And you know, as, you know, as you know, there's a kind of crisis in science education and the acceptance of science. science. Um, I think the United States is something like 26th in the world of, you know, 26 down on the list of science from science education um, excellence. So it means like we just don't have it, you know? And, and so this goal of this museum is to really get people excited about science, careers in science, learning about it, um, understanding it, um, understanding facts. <laughs> and um, so the way that our approach to this was to, to, to present something of a place of, that would want to be discovered. And, um, it, you know, as I said, a, a lot of my work and my, my interests have been in looking at nature very closely. These are just drawings that um, I've made in the past, but, but to understand why it why those forms are like that, not just to replicate them. But usually these forms like you see here are the result of ages and ages of wind and water action. Um, and so there's a certain logic to how they represent flow. So this museum edition, we are trying to create a kind of flow, uh, both for the visitors, but also and the overall museum and, and, and also this sense of discovery. Um, those are some spaces in nature where you, you, they're created by flow. So these are really interesting because they are almost not objects, but in, interior spaces in a certain way, um, carved out. And um, this was kind of where we were going with it. Of course, in architecture, you have also 
iconic interior spaces that are um, created almost feeling like they're about flow to me. Um, so one of the things we did with the design team, um, that's me right there and some team members, we, we took a big road trip out west and we tried to find, like, we just wanted to do hiking, I guess it was for fun, but it was also to really study some of these spaces that are carved out like that. This one was really interesting because it was almost identical in scale to the space that we were designing. Um, and and this, this is a little out of order, but it was really the first uh, sketch when we were in the competition, this idea of discovery about um, flow. And you can see here this Manhattan Hench, which is the event when the sun sets on axis with the Manhattan grid. So what a better way to tie this architecture to nature, the, the Natural History Museum, than to capture this phenomena within the building. So this, this kind of canyon that we're making, this atrium, is aligned with uh, 77th Street um, to create this almost a viewing platform for this event, which actually happens you know, twice um, a year. Um, and then, uh, you know, of course, digital tools are hugely important for this project, but we really weren't able to get the right uh, feel with the digital tools that were available. We ended up, in fact, having to um, write a unique program with, you know, with consultants to help us to, to get the um, software to do what we wanted it to do. But before that, you know, of course, as Peter said, Chicago is just so cold. And we just took out this um, big blocks of ice and started melting them. I remember doing it as a child, actually. My mom would heat up a tea kettle of hot water and then I would take it outside and create sculptures in the, in the big you know, mounds of snow that were piled up. Um, so we kind of did the same thing here and it really was very instructive. We, I mean, this is a picture from that ice melting uh, model which um, as we progress this into the digital tools, um, it really became about creating this. It's almost like it's an object, but it's an, a space. It's a space that you occupy, it's structural. And that's a big difference I think between um, our work and maybe some other people that are interested in similar formal things. We're adamant about this thing being a structure. So it is a, a kind of iconic void, if you will, that that is porous, and it supports the floors of the museum that then connect to the, the rest of the um, museum at large. Um, and so it's about a space about discovery, seeing something, moving toward it, um, light from somewhere that you can't see. Um, and this is the way this is the way it works, you know, structurally that it's. These forces are all, you know, coming down. These are true arches, and uh, these oculi at the top um, support the skylights that come into the space. And and here's what I mean about this place being connective. It's really connecting um, all the existing floors of the museum on every level into the space where you can change levels. And beyond this section, there's a big theater space in here as well. Um, and then these forces, of course, go down to the, the Manhattan schist and the nice that's down there and the layers of support in Manhattan, which to your point, Peter, I really do see Manhattan as something different than Chicago. I, I think that it's really a city that feels almost like it's been eroded out of of a solid, <laughs> the way that the step back skyscrapers work. And it, it feels like a big rock, whereas uh, Chicago, yeah, it's built on a swamp, basically, but each building is its own entity and together they create almost a geologic uh, mountain range. That was a, an early sketch of this uh, structural space. Um, 
that that um, is like I said an innie building because this is buildings all around it. It only shows up on the edges, um, and this is a later um, image. And the the thing that is revealed in the sketch uh, shown by Peter is this collections core, which we're trying to make visible so that people understand how the collection is used still in science today. It's really used to as a tool um, to um, like you can take a, an age old artifact or rock or anything and take it into a lab and do an MRI scan on it and, and learn new things about nature. So, um, so the, this image shows the uh, atrium looking back towards uh, 77th street. So you will be able to see, you know, Manhattan hand on this axis from the bridges or from the, the space. Um, and able to enter into different exhibits from the central space. Um, there will be a live uh, vivarium for uh, butterflies in this, which, um, and, and also a display of all the insects that the museum has. So there's some collections that are also being shown, even though this is an education wing. Um, and this insect collection has never been shown really in the museum. They've had it buried deep in the bowels, and it will be uh, for one of the first time that it's brought out in its full glory. So I think that's, I was just going to show you that one project today. So um, I can always, oops, I can always add more uh, if we have more time, but I thought that maybe going in depth in one project would be a good way to start, to, to, to add to the conversation. Even though it's not what you would normally be thought of as the core of your work, I mean, you have the issue that you have done these high rises. Mm. Uh, and in a way, um, they, to such an extent that it's intriguing. I mean, I, 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 I respect what you've done. And also, I did show lots of pictures from your book. So, you uh -huh. know. There's no doubt that people watching, if they didn't know your work that well, they've seen a quick run through many things, but you are identified with the high rise, but your moment of interest, or the thing that you want to tell us about is that cave-like building. Is that because, uh, can I ask a funny question? Is that because you know you're very good at high rises? <laughs> you're bored with them i mean that would be too provocative but like yeah sure guys i can do how you, are you like some jazz player who always does a certain kind of thing and is saying no i've i'm you know i'm not playing that instrument i'm playing a different instrument and it's really great you know i never knew that you could get this out of a double bass or whatever it might be or is it that, that i noticed when you gave the lecture at the uh at the Bartlett, you talked about a project down on the Mississippi, for instance, mm -hmm. which you have not put in the book. That uh, me. One aspect of it is in there is called Stone Stories, mm -hmm. uh, the, and which is in the material section, what are you made of? And it really, what are you made of also has other meanings. You know, what, what are you all about? And I think it applies to all of us. We ask ourselves these questions. Um, so I can show another project um, on the high rise side. I, I'd like to talk more about process, as you can tell, um, okay. just uh -huh. the final, yeah. but I'll do that. You know, there is this thing that, that you know, we, we sometimes, I, I think you're taking an in, interesting point on, on using this event because, um, we can assume that somebody is known as you if people are interested they can find lots and lots and lots of pictures of the buildings now they can go and buy a big book etc cetera, etc cetera. and you should talk about what you want to talk about uh and i've 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 suffered this myself in in the past you know that if you did something very very known it it hung around you for Decades, <laughs> and you would like, could be the last thing you want to talk about. But there's this guy saying, "Well, and what about?" And um, I think that it's interesting that you you've taken the cave, and then you have 
shown that you are fitting it into a very site-specific condition. Mm. Now, does that mean that that's what it's about, that if you, if you had a tabula rasa site, you couldn't mm. possibly do that building? Probably could not. And, and, and in fact, in, in, a, in a more more like a tabula rasa site, the the um, the triangular building, the one with the orifice, that in, when you describe it, you describe as it looking out towards certain things on the site, certain things on the adjoining site. So perhaps that's what it's about. I think you. It's. Um... The reason I bring that one up is, you know, it, we spoke about form in the past, and I, you are so articulate in describing formal um, moves. Although in our work, there's so much more, at, there's so much more um, at work there than the form. But the form is difficult to achieve, and it takes many iterations. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that. You know, in in the past, maybe before industrialization, before the industrial revolution, there were forms evolved very, very slowly over time, and then suddenly it was possible for you to draw something one day and produce it the next. Now more than ever, and so there are. It is not easy to turn certain corners, um, make transitions between things that are just that just have not been really, there's no history of doing it, you know? So, so the work that you showed of, uh, well, of, well, someone like Gaudi also would, had, was working in a very um, experimental way and iterative way to understand how to work with these kind of forms. I, I think it's important to, to, make sure that the this is structural I, I i think that you know this is the tie into tall buildings are uh, so much about structure and um but i think that it, it makes the work stronger if it is also structurally relevant and um communicative when you see the American Museum of Natural History space, you understand the forces coming down. When you see a tall building, um, you should be able to read it as a, a cantilever, which is what it is coming out of the ground. Um, so that that's a really Im important um, preoccupation. And it's one of the reasons why with our modeling um, that we try to use materials in modeling that that are a little bit similar to what the final material is, whether it's um, ice for the AM and H or, or using cast materials for, for concrete models. Um, and and that, that part, how you model, uh, you know, if you're a student, there's so much tendency I see today that it's just like, go print the model. And that is very useful, believe me, for something. But, but I think there's there's something to be always discovered in your process of um, modeling and how you decide to make what you're making, what materials you choose to make it out of. And we tend to um, make a lot of models with paper, in fact, just to, because it's, um, it's not so predetermined. You can cut it, fold it to get stiffness change things so you're really designing in this um, in this mode um, so that's that's very important for our process also I think with with what what's interesting about taller buildings it becomes you know there there's an important aspect of how does the individual relate to this taller structure um, I would show you maybe um, this project, if I can share my screen again, which you mentioned um, briefly. And let's see if it's in the middle. Uh, the, this Mira Tower in San Francisco. Um, 
you know, I, I like residential because I like the people to live in the city, and but I want to see the individual house, you know, like um, not more more seeing the individual house than the than the overall uh, shape of some building. So this is kind of very straightforward global shape, but it expresses the individual home um, stacked up. And that's, you know, you can see this bay windows throughout San Francisco where each one has its own personality in this case, and they're reaching out to grab light. And so that was our basic idea here is starting with uh, a bay window uh, with views and the site we have is very, there's so much variety, different views of the bridges, different views of uh, the city. So we just incorporated that. I mean, the sketch on the right is, is really showing these little bay windows starting to be splayed along a, a line, a trajectory that's somewhat spiraling, um, you know, as you find in nature, uh, growth pattern. Um, and it allowed us to also be strategic about the construction of these. Maybe these could be prefabricated. So that was, that was the idea. Um, here's a little bit later sketch of the bays starting to rotate along those lines. Um, and then you can see the, um, the different configurations for different types of rooms and all of this to be prefabricated with insulation, waterproofing, and cladding before it arrives on the site. Um, maybe you can see in the, this is the, in the middle here, the plan of how the bays change as they move up. They uh, start to splay out and capture different views. And here you can see the prefabricated parts showing up on, on site, which really helped to minimize the construction time, which is another huge factor for these types of buildings. Um, they really are, they test you in different ways. You know, you have to be kind of cunning about how it's going to be built to, to get it over the finish line. Um, because if, if something is, ends up being impossible or too difficult or takes too long, it could endanger, you know, getting the project so there's this is a very logical part of this this work um here you can see the plan so there's a low rise on the left and the high rise on the right this is um san francisco very seismic size uh, seismic high seismic loads so this is actually quite a good um orientation for the tower structure um but the units the little homes, they kind of spread out and reach out to the facade and then have these different bays according to. Um, this, this project is also a 40% affordable uh, housing in um, San Francisco, which is not an easy feat also. And um, we can, and the affordable units are below market rate units are also interspersed through the whole project, not, not just on the low rise part. So it's really trying to be equitable uh, with the, the, the city is really trying to provide more um, affordable housing. Um, but you can see here the, the, all these prefabricated elements being installed. And um, there, it's more, it's almost finished now, but this was, I think, the most recent image I had when we went to publish of the book. But what I really think is interesting with these towers is that you, they are, when you create the models in your, you know, in your office, you can, you can really see um, what's going to happen. And I'm interested in these, um, Globally, it's it's um, it's adding up the, the 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 elements to create this global rhythm. But it is um, but individually, you can still connect to a, a house or someone's someone's place. Um, and I think that gives it a more human 
connection because it, um, I think one of the problems with going tall is just that it, you know, it can be a little bit um, hard to connect when you're walking down the street to a, a giant mirrored building, you know, and um, th th this kind of work helps to um, tie the scale back down to the pedestrian. So there's something for them walking down the street as well as the um, person who gets to live there, lucky them. Um, I'll do one more that's in design. And um, uh, of course, this one is probably threatened now that um, after the pandemic, but this is a hotel to be built in Boston. And what, what's so interesting here is, um, this is not in the book, by the way, um, but it's um, a triangular site that we created out of nothing. So for example, so here's, here's the famous Sitco sign in, in Boston, which is a landmark near um, Red Sox Park. And you can see this view coming down Commonwealth. Avenue. And what's, what's, I think what's interesting about this project is on an urban scale, what we did, and here, these are just some, some details of it, how this hotel um, windows work. Um, but here on the, on the left-hand side is the intersection today. Um, and you can see there's lots of traffic going all around it, and it's, it's all about cars. And we argued, um, that one could make a site in the middle of this big auto intersection um, and urbanistically put the roads on a little diet and, and make more safe crossings for pedestrians and bikes. Um, and to create at the same time a building in the middle of that. It's, it's a square, Kenmore Square, that's always been a problematic in, in Boston and this would somehow make it into a place. Um, we were lucky that, and oh, this, this shows the previous public realm, 8,700 uh, square feet. And after we did this project, we can create about 32,300 square feet. And so there's something, a benefit to the, the, the city beyond the building benefit to the owner, I guess, but it's, it's really doing something for the city. Um, and so here it is in the middle, um, and you can see how it um, creates more of a, like a, a meeting point in the city. And this is before, and this is, okay, so, um, sorry, that was just another kind of quick view of a project that's on the boards. Oh. <laughs> In the tower. I, I, was, I was delighted to hear you talk about bay, I'm sitting in a bay window as I speak actually <laughs> so it's a sort of 100 year old bay window of the, of the London type but um, and there is something agreeable about that I, I, I have views down the street as well as into the garden as well as another you know I have three views and, and also different qualities of light during the day because oh, you have absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. But mm -hmm. I, I think it's interesting that you, I wondered if um, when you mentioned uh, and you show the quick reference to the, the bay windows of San Francisco, when you're working in, say, San Francisco, do you feel that it's a, a gentler grain, not only not just the bay windows, but the whole feel of San Francisco is, is, a, is a sort of I'm looking not just gentle is the wrong word, but but it, it, it That's has, it's, it's very different from Chicago. It's oh yes, I mean the, the more fragile in a way. Yeah, the 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 um, well, the building has to be delicacy. More fragile. The as delicacy as of it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's it's true, and it it's it's interesting that it's been difficult to do very good modern architecture in uh, San Francisco. It, it doesn't have a good reputation for, for doing mm. the best new buildings, um, but I think they're, they're trying to up, up that game a bit. Um, I think it's, it's a place where um, 
the older fabric is strong, very strong, stronger than the strong and delicate, but it's, it's definitely, um, you're having to deal with charm. Mm. Yeah, charm. charm mm -hmm. which is a very difficult <laughs> uh, thing. And, and, uh, I think very different from Chicago. It's a very good reading of it. Yes. Mm. It has that. And has charm that. is tricky because it can also be a, a trap. Mm -hmm. you try work with a charming city it can be sometimes quite inhibiting actually like a uh, whole city that you can do anything that is easier to handle more. right I mean, I mean paris comes to mind yeah it's, but uh, you know, I, I just want to pick up one one more thing before throwing it to the wolves or the not the wolves the, the guys out there um because you refer not only to materiality and and just systematics but also to engineering mm. and I wondered if that is something where the Chicago factor is a very positive that you have tremendous uh, tradition of engineering your buildings are almost all of them engineering pieces uh, what the city doesn't have in that twee charm it has in Mm. Tough achievement, you know, it was built to hang on in this kind of thing. Uh, did you do you tend to use Chicago engineers? Do you tend to use the same engineers? Well, you know, I grew up, I, I'm the daughter of an engineer. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, didn't know, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. But, okay. Yeah. And, um, but I, I think, you know, I've always really loved collaborating with engineers um in fact we have a fellow here at our office peter heppel peter heppel who's a british um, engineer who worked with peter rice and he's doing a stint with us here within the office in fact right now but we work with a lot of different engineers and um but it's it's really crucial to have that kind of very collaborative relationship for me i i like to bounce things off the engineer like because they will call you on it if you're just you know <laughs> you're going up the wrong tree um and they're always it's almost like um a measure of you know is this a good idea is it can this be done what's you know th those conversations very early are are very important so yes working yeah. with Chicago engineers, yes, but but um, another one, Rory McGowan from um, Over up in the Dublin office is an engineer I collaborate with a lot. Uh, Guy Nordenson in New York, who's very creative um, engineer, and um, Ron Klemensik is out of uh, Seattle, who's um, works a lot on tall buildings and his specialty is really the um, the means and methods, you know, like how is this thing going to be built? So those are, yeah, those are all really key um, people to collaborate with them. Um, usually very early in the process and even in the concept stage. And that's why those particular en engineers I like, they are capable of having those conversations and not, not all engineers are, so. Now, I know there are a whole load of questions from other people piling up, and I'm gonna hand over to Max to uh, bring him in, I think. Thanks, uh, thanks, Peter, thanks, Jeannie. That was a fascinating presentation, absolutely wonderful work. Um, so we have some questions that have come in from um, YouTube and from within, um, the lecture that we have here. So I'm just going to first of all ask one question that's come from YouTube, um, which is from um, Sharavan um, Aaron. And the question is about, um, she says that she's uh, an architectural student at um, the University of Illinois. Um, and how do you find a balance between doing social justice projects such as the Arca Center and your high-rise towers. So that's sort of quite a polemic question. So I wonder if you want to. Yeah. Um, um, well, I think the the, the high-rise towers 
you know, frankly, I never thought I would be doing high rise towers. It was, it was almost um, an accident that I was invited to do one. Um, and, but then in doing that, I realized that the, you know, the tower in fact is got something going for it. It's a, it's a way to put many uh, dwellers within the center of the city and reduces carbon. I think it's, it's incredible difference between um, the carbon expense in living in a, like a suburban pattern versus living in a tower that's connected to the city and easy for people to walk to work and walk to all of their grocery stores and things like that. So that was compelling. And then I, it became about, you know, how do you uh, make people feel more socially connected in the tower? Uh, because it seemed that this just wasn't um, a concern when I started this, the, that first project with the Aqua Tower. It was really um, all about the privilege of living in this tall building and not about being part of the city, more of an exclusive type arrangement. So, so that's been the thing that I've really been fascinated with is to connect people to the outdoors and to the city, to their neighbors, and to reduce the, the carbon um, footprint of living, you know, and this both things are really crucial. So I don't see them in conflict with the social justice approach that I'm, I'm really interested in environmental justice issues too. And so in our office, we always try to have projects that are addressing these key things that we care about, um, about our, about racial justice, environmental justice, social justice in general, um, and try to pick those projects and 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 lift them up and give them visibility. Um, and and frankly, you know, not all those projects have very big budgets at all. And they, you know, um, sometimes we use our profits from a bigger project and put it toward a project that has no fee at all. You know, so that that's kind of how it's like the little Robin Hood method, I guess, <laughs> of um, of trying to do both scales but they're equally important to me and to all of us that here. I think we, you know, my, my team is so committed to these issues as well. And we're, we're always trying to address them through our medium, which is architecture. Um, I, actually, there's a question that's come again from YouTube, which actually ties into the idea of the medium. And the question is, after publishing books such as Reverse Effect, reveal and your newest book what do you believe is the importance of architectural publications and the documentation of your practice so the relationship between publications you do and the practice that's, that's a great question it's it's so uh crucial i wish i did it more even but it, it is it is um crucial for articulating you know, your position uh, on something, or in the case of reverse effect, it was really toward cre getting action on a, a political issue. And so it, the, the written word, the, the articulation of your thoughts and architecture is, is really, really important, both from your own personal process, my own personal process of design, but also to communicate to others and share and like, like this, format that we're using right now on, on Zoom, but it, you know, the, the book will, the publications will reach a different audience and start different conversations. And, and that is, that's our, our world in architecture. We, it really depends on this kind of debate. And some, of course, not all architects participate in that, that uh, debate, but I'm sure that all of the students at the Bartlett are part of this debate and will continue to be throughout their career. I hope. Thank you for that. Um, there's now a question from um, Frosso, uh, who is in the audience. Frosso, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Um, well, it's very inspirational, uh, Jean. Uh, two topics, two different topics. One is, uh, I mean, I love, uh, it's very personal because, you know, I think in the same way, which is, I'm not saying it's right, but this way, 
that you master in a very humble but profound way the science. So you look at nature, you interpret it. So how you interpret nature and intuitively, I didn't know, I mean, I heard it, but I didn't know that your dad was a engineer. So the idea that it's embedded, it's not sort of showing off, let's make a big engineering noise here. But the fact that it's a more of an existential thing that it's got to stand up, but in a very personal and sort of whatever way, for me, I find this amazing, inspirational. So this is not a question. It's just saying that it's rare for students that are listening now of us, a occasion where you say, you give a why, but the why is very instinctive, but also rational, that with the environmental disaster, with the climate, with the money issue or social, the idea that you actually have a reason in the nature issue, it's not formal, the form has a reason, which is personal, but also scientific. So I find this exceedingly inspirational and thanks a lot. I was going to ask you something on, you know, how Peter managed to divert you from the building, which I love, you know, the, with the caves and going to the tower topic. That's my question really. Um, you can master an, structural engineering very well in terms of these towers you can master the facade beautifully panels and you know light and all that stuff so i was wondering in a hardcore boys world of whatever of tower blocks as a metaphor have you tried i mean basically to explore how a tower block could be a vertical city where in a city not only as you said you bring nature and uh, blah blah and parachutes and uh, open spaces but also you have this unknown, you know, the accidents. So have you managed to convince any developers, any, you know, big charge to say, trust me of this. And that could be almost like your building is a catalyst. So you don't know the brief exactly, but it can have, you know, stupid students, acrobats, uh, homeless people, high rise, social housing, expensive uh, lofts. Is that a realistic possibility in your operation. Yeah. Um, I love the idea of acrobats in the, in the tower as well. It's a great idea. Um, you know, I think the, the issue of, of mixing the uses more fully, more dramatically um, is an interesting one. And um, I see some opportunity to do that in maybe not in tall buildings because you know frankly so much of it has to be about the structure and the vertical transportation that there's not a lot left to you know play with so i think it, the site would be important for that but i have i do see the opportunity for this and some interest in in um, a more radical mix of uses in large scale buildings that no one knows what to do with. For example, um, in Chicago, there is a gigantic old U U.S. post office that the post office, you know, was too expensive to operate or something, and they moved out. Um, and the floor plates are enormous, and the scale of the space is enor enor enormous. Um, and so there's just some real creativity in thinking about how to use this um, differently. And I think buildings like that offer, I mean, it would be interesting to go search out these kind of BMS buildings. Um, one building that um, we did something very interesting with in terms of the mix uh, was to take an old um, coal burning power plant at Beloit College in Wisconsin and turn it into like a three pronged it's for the college but it, it has a health center a recreation and a student center in it um and, and this this in this unlikely gigantic shell of an old power plant um so and i i really love the idea of reusing buildings for different uses and being more um free with how they are um renovated and not, not necessarily a historic preservation building, but, but um, really reinventing them. And, and um, so the high rise, I don't know if it's the best place to, to 
radically mis mixed uses, although it has been tried in the past, like Bertrand Goldberg, for example, at Marina City, had a school, um, um, common areas, a boat, a docking area at the bottom, a car park, and apartments all in one high-rise building. Um, so yeah, I think w w the, the context today is a little bit difficult the way that they are um, financially um, sketched out by their owners. But um, I, I do think it is, it's a fertile area to explore and would be great to maybe do a studio about that at some point. But thanks for that question. That's, that's thanks, that. thanks a lot. Um, so we now have another question from um, Alfie um, G, who's one of our second year students. Alfie, would you like to turn your camera on and ask your question to Jimmy, please? Yeah, hi. Um, I thought, sort of looking at what you were doing, it seemed like you're really adept at doing both kind of additive buildings like you did in Boston, where it's like, here's an opportunity for us to put something sort of add to this site. And then you've kind of like, I, I'm sure it's more combined in your mind, but in the way I was seeing it, there was like uh, the projects where we're more carving away and you're talking about those geological processes and stuff. And uh, it was it was interesting that you were just saying to Frosso about the renovations, because I mean, you've kind of got, uh, it becomes very explicit when you're doing uh, renovating buildings that you're very much adding or taking away from it. And those are the choices. So. I was just wondering when you're looking at a site, what's uh, what, what's a site that you go, hey, here's one we're gonna scoop out of, or hey, here's one where we're gonna build up onto, kind of in a really basic way. <laughs> um, thanks for that question. Yeah, it's like how to intervene. On, you know, you have urban infill sites and in cities, and then more, more and more, um, we're starting to have sites. Like in Brazil, we're doing the U.S. Embassy in, in Brasilia, and it's really a project where you know you have to have it has to have space around it for reasons that you can only imagine. But um, so you end up, you know, it it's somewhat an object placing in a site. Um, but I think um, if if. Mm, I think your question is is about um, are are you more interested in like the, the outside uh, form or some kind of uh, revelation of program and on the interior? Ideally, you would have both. I mean, right? you'd have a site that's a great site. You can see the building from every side, and then have some incredible space on the inside of it. I guess that would be my ideal, but I guess you don't always get to choose your site. But um, but I don't know if, if space is 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 um, people are not talking about space enough anymore. I don't uh -huh. you know do you, yeah. you know what I mean? It's it's a lot about facade and and techniques and effects, but um, space is what it's always the thing that I remember most. Um, it, it like when you enter a space, like the the halls of a cathedral, or or a canyon, or a um, or a Corbusian building where the space is very dynamic, um, or a Frank Lloyd Wright building where you're very compressed and then opened up. I mean, and those are the kind of those memories for me are strong stronger than maybe the, the effects on the outside. There's actually a quite nice question that leads on from that from Owen, who's in our first year. Owen, would you like to ask your question, please? Yeah, hi. Um, I was just thinking about, so your project in New York, um, obviously a load bearing structure. Um, it looks like it's concrete, but kind of that reference to like a load bearing stone um, and then in the exterior context of the project, obviously New York is kind of filled with these steel frame buildings with the facade um, of a stone skin, where that stone skin only be inch deep. It's that kind of faking of that kind of weight and heaviness of the natural world. 
Um, I was wondering in kind of what way the building relates to that exterior context, if it's any way a critique of it, kind of similar to how James Sterling pokes a hole in the Stuttgart building, you know, and kind of puts some bricks on the outside and then reveals that structure. Um, yeah, and also how it kind of responds to the classical context mm -hmm. of the building it fits within. That's, that's a great question. You know, probably one of the most difficult things about that building was then when you get to the outside, then what? <laughs> it, you know, you have this interior uh, space that's doing all these things and then how does it get to the outside? And so um, in, in that case, and maybe you saw in the sketch, it was um, the idea that the inside gets exposed to the outside on those small parts. Um, and, um, it, but the choice of how to, you know, what, how do you support it? What kind of material is it? How does it relate to what's around it? Um, ha had a lot of things to consider. And um, what we ended up doing is, I, I think the priority, the hierarchy of these elements to, to consider was really, you know, the, the, the party of that building, which is to extend the axis along 75th Street through the museum um, and come out the other side. So on the opposite, on the east side of that axis is a, one of the buildings that was built in 1934 is a stone clad um, building using a sp very specific kind of granite. Um, there, but then there's everything else in between on this built on the outside of the buildings, very eclectic. So um, we decided to use that stone, the, the stone that was on the east side on the west facade to thus um, complete that axis, the Manhattan Henge axis. And um, in order to do that, we actually, we had to inquire to reopen the quarry that had that original stone up in Massachusetts. And we were able to um, get the stone, Milford granite and so it was really, it was, it's kind of, it ties back to the context through that choice of the specific material. Um, and, you know, not, it, not extending the concrete to the outside, but, but really being part of the overall campus on the outside and, and wrapping in, it becomes the concrete. Wow, that sounds absolutely incredible. Um, there's a question now from um, Esme. Um, Esme, would you like to ask your question? Hi, Esme, are you still here? Or would you like me to ask the question for you? Okay, Esme may not have her camera there. So the question is um, from Esme and she asks, a lot of your forms seem further more advanced than the idea of um, biomimicry when gaining inspiration from other organic forms such as ice. What is the process that allows you to abstract these forms rather than simply mimicking them? Hmm. And from what I understand of biomimicry, it is about, it's sometimes about processes as well, not only form, but it, it, it's, um, it's, I've always, you know, it's, it's hard for an architect to put their work into some kind of like name like that because it's, it's not what is causing me to do that, it, but but to, to be sure, there is a lot of complex, amazing form that is functional or um, for a reason in nature. And and um, Darcy Thompson's book is you know the classic book that that speaks about these things. But of course, there's many more newer editions that that speak about biomimicry. And um, I, I think um, drawing is is really key. Draw, uh, I mean, drawing what you see and it, it, it helps you understand the structure of it when you draw. Um, I, I, I hope that everyone tries drawing what, what you see because um, that's how you understand th things, uh, those relationships between parts. 
and um and studying i think like one of my favorite books is animal architecture it was a german author i think it, it speaks about all these nests and uh different types of structures that animals build for for what reason um for maybe for thermal reasons maybe for uh citing a structure in such a place that to for protection um many different reasons and and then you see the resulting form and it just connects so much to what it how it functions so yeah i think that these are really interesting things we need to know more about um this especially with relation to climate i, I mean um for example um just a quick example the uh montparnasse tower that that peter was showing that we did um the existing tower has this um, kind of dense in the it, like uh, arrow shaped cutouts out of the oval in plan, and and we found that these were um, creating the really like negative um, effect on the structure, and they had to overpower that structure, build it, overbuild it to be able to. Uh, withstand the wind that was getting caught in these little cutouts. So, you know, it, it clearly was a formal gesture that had nothing to do with the aerodynamics of the tower. And so in, in our proposal, we filled those in. Um, and then with the bumpy facade um, of these bays that the, the kind of textured facade, uh, we also reduced the uh, um, turbulence that the wind was causing on the, on the tower. So, so we were able to remove some structure in, in doing this, this new approach. So it, you know, it would save material and save carbon to do that. So a lot of times there's just a real direct relationship between these natural forms because nature, you know, wants to use zero energy as much as possible. Like it, it, it's, it's really trying to be minimal. And um, so that's one of the things you can take away from most um, shapes and forms that you find in nature that are usually trying to be economical, but in doing so, they create, you know, a beautiful thing. Um, so, yeah, I, I learn a lot from looking very closely at nature and structure and, um, and reading a lot about, about it all the time. It's fascinating. <laughs> thank you thank you very much um so there's a question um from um farbod who is in the audience here farbod would you like to ask your question hello can you hear me yeah yeah uh, thank you Jeannie and peter for your great presentation and conversation uh Jeannie, when i uh, look at your project i notice that you you have done a, a continuous attempt to explore the, the box shape of the building. I want to know what is the ultimate point for you in this process of exploding. And I would be happy if Peter shares his idea on this topic too. Hmm. I thought, Peter, you go first. <laughs> well, I think that <clears throat> Not only do we never see the box in nature, but in fact, the box uh, takes it. It's usually used where there's a equivalent condition. So that what you've been talking, there's been a bit of a conversation about you know other other things happening, other than a typical condition. So that's one thing. Uh, as soon as the other things happen, it seems to me that you could even have a structural condition <clears throat> that was fairly consistent. But the periphery doesn't have to be, the infill doesn't have to be, you don't even have to fill it all in. But there was this kind of boneheaded thing. It's rather like sitting here in lockdown, everything, everything, and there are <clears throat> seven apartments in this building. So there's a lot of deliveries. Everything comes in a box, <laughs> you know, and then you take it out and half of it's styrene or half of it's wrapping mm. or what or what. You never, you know, if somebody's having a chair, we had a chair delivered 
the other day, but it came in a box. So we had to assemble the chair. Somebody else has a, I don't know, a coffee pot. It is not box shaped. It's the sort of thing, it's okay, maybe it's easy for them sticking in the van, but you know, the world is not a van. It's not a delivery <laughs> van. And it's, I think it's, <clears throat> I think it's sort of boneheadedness. I don't think it's just economics. I think it's a why bother otherwise. And it doesn't seem to go away. Uh, there have been, you know, the, the sort of man and lady in the street have often said, you know, why, it, a few years ago, would say, well, why do they build all these matchbox buildings? But so a few people then stuck a funny roof on the matchbox. But when, along the matchbox, none, notwithstanding. I can't see it myself, you know, I think the world isn't in a, in a box, it's relieved from a box. We, we, you know, the building I'm living in, in with this bay window, then above me, there are balconies and above that there are even studios or even double height studio rooms, which was sort of developer's idea a hundred years ago. Uh, that wasn't a box, and they've <clears throat> they've never been empty, you know, in a hundred years. Uh, and I think it's I just think it's laziness. It's a simple it's laziness and lack of bother. And I think if you if you guys <clears throat> all the time keep proving that there are economic, interesting, purchasable, saleable whatever, whatever, you know, repeatable element buildings. It's quite interesting because in these, <clears throat> in these conversations last week, uh, we, we spoke to Sue Fujimoto and he you know, starts off with his famous little tight box. And now <clears throat> in Paris and in the south of France, in Montpellier, his boxes have taken off, you know, your, your boxes have taken off. There's the really interesting people, the boxes have taken off <laughs> and have spluttered into something else. It's the Dumbos who will put everything in a cardboard box and metaphor and mentally wrap it in styrene, you know. I was thinking of um, the, uh, the, the Vista Tower, just when you were speaking about boxes and maybe to show you a quick image of um, the geometry there about um, hang on let me share my screen for one second um, if it's still possible yeah go for it okay, right. yeah. okay. Um, just to show this um, this iterations on the form of the, that tower but you know the thing about towers a lot are about packing packing problems and you know packing in what you can get in because it's very expensive to go tall so you need to like you know get it packed in so but this shape this frustum shape is is really su superior in terms of packing than a box and what we discovered, you can see the upper left is if it were just extruded uh, boxes, some attempts to create more maybe curvilinear ones, um, but then getting into this this packing problem. And um, it, it's the benefit is really that you get more corners and corners are great when you're if, to not be in an extrusion, you get the, like what we were talking about with the bay window light from different directions um and so in this stacking of the different frustum shapes which is like a truncated pyramid um and you will see things in the grocery store like packed this way because you can get more in in a, in a smaller space it's more logical or like a hexagon is also a good packing element like in a beehive um but but this allowed us to to really get many more um corner windows on on the tower and also um to lift up the centerpiece um so that we could get a public space going through this building at the base so i think there's a lot more to discover in these non uh box shapes 
Thank you. That was a uh, really great answer uh, from both of you. Um, we've probably got time for about two more questions. Um, and um, there's one question that has come in from um, YouTube, um, which is how is the concept of um, active idealism woven into the newest projects? Um, and then there's a, a question that follows from that. I'll ask that now. Um, so that you can maybe ask, answer both at the same time. Um, this is from Maxine um, Sean on YouTube. And how are you incorporating, well, actually we'll come to that one in the end, but how are you incorporating the recent pandemic and recent events in your design? And how has it affected your design process? They're two quite different questions. Yeah, I think the first one is referring to what I call actionable idealism, which is the way that um, I just described our practice practice and what motivates us why do we do what we do it's it's i know it's idealistic let's say to have this idea that there could be this better world but it, we we can get there through action actionable idealism so that that's and and it's still yeah in our in our projects now we are you know we're we're always doing a project that is maybe doesn't have a client but it's um um, something that is um, needs attention and the thing that we're doing right now is um, a project that is building off of the the rooftop that we did here on our building in Chicago and the where we've been measuring the biodiversity on this rooftop because we know that you know the, the species extinction is, is is happening very rapidly right now with climate change. So the urgent idea of this rooftop is not just to have a nice green outdoor space to to, act, to hang out in, but that's part of it. But it's really, we're trying to up the number of species. So we keep measuring once a year. Um, uh, we do a total um, uh, um, data collection of all the species of insects even microbes, we, we collaborate with uh, uh, the Field Museum here. Um, bats, birds, everything that we can count in 24 hours. And we've been, um, the great news is on this rooftop, we've, we've um, achieved a status of a, of a, we're just at the very bottom of the, the, the status of a, a rich ecosystem. And so that's on year five. Okay, so now our, our project has been to encourage our neighbors to install these. And so the, the vision that I have for this thing is that it could be a kind of a biodiverse rooftop corridor through the city um, that helps the city be, be more resilient, but also helps you know support through the types of plantings that we have, support the species that come and use it um, for food and uh, habitat. So anyway, that's one project. And, and we're working on something now. We want to do uh, another project. Um, so it, it, it's, it's through our independent projects, but it's also like those things then spill out into and inform our other projects that we're doing for other clients. Um, so it, I, I feel that almost like the first question about public publishing it's equally important to have these ongoing research projects and projects that are about action, action, actionable idealism. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have time, just um, one question from Reem and then um, Frosser wants to ask one other question about process and making for the students. So um, Reem, would you like to come on and ask your question, please? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, Hello. nice to meet you. Um, thank you, Peter and Jean, for this really inspiring presentation. It makes me want to try something new during the summer holiday. Uh, and my question is, when you started working on Aqua Tower, you found that some towers might be exclusive and others might encourage um, social cohesion. And I was wondering, considering the hyper-density of buildings and how the relationship between let's say flats might be how would you what would what design method 
would he use to encourage social cohesion between people living in the building and social integrity within the site? Oh, thank you for that question. No, I think, um, you know, the first step is, is giving people outdoor space in these buildings. I mean, it, it, you know, when we did the Aqua Tower, it, there, there just wasn't a tower with outdoor terraces all the way up to the 82nd floor. You know, it, it's, it's a little bit maybe scary, some people think, but you, you would not believe how easy it is to get used to stepping out on a terrace on the, very high up. I, 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 um, the first time we took our photographer up there, he was tying off to the, uh, the balconies and so on. But then, you know, it, it's like literally in 15 minutes, you kind of like, okay, I'm on this perch way up high and, and you suddenly are, you feel like you're in the city. And it, so the first connection social, socially to be able to see your neighbors from their terrace and not make them into these private um, places that are not um, connected. Um, they're really the, the, the front stoop, like the porch of, a, of an apartment in the high rise. Um, so that's that's one. It's kind of more of a virtual connection. You see someone and say hi, you know, <laughs> across the way. Um, and I, and I, bel the balconies became even more important during this lockdown, didn't it? Because I know I was reading in Milan how people would go out and play instruments on their balconies. And in France, they were. Um, uh, one one of my friends sent me a. A video of every every week they would have this question for the whole apartment um, courtyard so it was like questions for the courtyard and they would come out on their balconies and someone would have a philosophical question and then everybody would be able to talk about that for the week so I mean the balcony is a social vehicle uh, number one I think and then after that it becomes you know how can you plan in other spaces for uh, sharing. Maybe I, I, a project that I designed that was um, more theoretical was an idea of apartments that where you could um, intermix, you could have, you could buy less space if you shared a kitchen, let's say with other people. So there could be ways to make apartments more affordable with more shared elements as well. Um, and I think those are also great opportunities for people to interact. Um, the Aqua Tower also has a shared um, amenity level, garden level on top of the base. And there's, um, people have started doing like um, organic gardening there and they've started different groups within the building. So giving those opportunities, you don't really have to dictate them all. They, some of them um, will just happen if there is space there that's available and attractive for people to use. Thanks for that. So um, whilst um, Frost is going to ask one question and at this time towards the end, if I just ask if everyone would like to also turn on their um, cameras and then we can see who your audience is both here. Um, you can't see your YouTube audience, but we've had many people watching via YouTube um, and internally we have a mixture of um, friends of Peter's from around the world. Um, and also we have um, our UCL students here. So on YouTube, you're watching um, this talk, which is around the world um, in eight hours with Sir Peter Cook. We're honored tonight that we, Peter's been speaking to Jimmy Gang from Studio Gang. Um, and uh, Frosso, would you like to um, ask? Yeah, yeah it's um, yeah, it's for both Peter and Jean. Um, two things, by the way, Reem, amazing point about uh, bringing uh, into visibility all this uh, you know, a banal thing of a balcony or a threshold or a windowsill. You know, I just want to ask both Peter and Jean, apart from it's about lockdown. And the other thing is about um, if a model, two completely different topics, if for students, it's more about educationally. Uh, you described beautifully, Jean, before how you go to a canyon with your friends, you come back, there's a bit of ice, your dad back home, and then the physicality of an accident inspires you to do something, but with reason. So now that these kids, I mean, it's okay if you're an architect and you can experiment, but for the young kids that don't know how accidents are amazing, like Peter could put a tower of carrots 
in one second, yeah? And then he makes an amazing scheme. But that means confidence and have fun about life. And not everybody can do that. So I'm just thinking with the lack of remotes in the lockdown, that kids can make stuff at home, students, but they don't have the confidence that out of crap, you can make something amazing or an accident of a model can be inspirational. So how do you both think, well, it's not a recipe, but your thoughts, you know, so we can make something out of it because it won't be finishing tomorrow. So. Hmm. Peter showed the, the um, um, project from that we made for the inside the net, uh, the National Building Museum, this paper tube um, dome for for parties and things inside there. You know that that was made out of the first model was made out of the inside of a paper toilet paper roll, <laughs> um, stacking them up and thinking about how to connect them. Um, there's, I mean, there's a world of of things that you can discover with just the materials they have laying around. You know what I mean? You kind of, um, one of my favorite materials is office supplies. <laughs> and um, uh, I made a tower out of baseball cards once. And, you know, you can use anything. Uh, and it, it's actually, you need a lot of something for towers anyway. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's the fun part is, that's why I love, I love modeling because it's, um, each thing like a baseball card has its own um, properties and then you can discover those properties and start with that instead of starting with the big idea just start with the properties and how do how do you connect one thing to another I don't know about the carrot tower I don't know how you connected them to each other thank thank you thank you for that um, before um before we sort of say goodbye, Peter will probably want to say something. And I just want to pass on um, a special thanks from um, Bob Scheel, our Director of School. So Bob um, can't join us tonight, but he wanted to say thank you both to Peter and to Jeannie for the great talk and also to express um, what a pleasure it is to see someone so in control of the art of their building. So that's a message from Bob that I wanted to pass on. Thank you. Wow. Peter, would you like to say anything before we... Um... Yeah, I'm just going to answer Frosso's question that yeah. about a week into the lockdown, and I'm <clears throat> over 80, and so I have to be careful, really careful. I'm still too scared to go into, flat, into a shop at this moment. <clears throat> Nearly, but not. I'm too scared to go into a shop. But, uh, so Yell has gone into her first shop today, and that's sort of, uh, what's going to happen? <laughs> Um, so the first thing that drove me mad was that my jigsaw had packed up. And so I had to <clears throat> order a jigsaw online as soon as it came. Not that I've done that much with it since it's come, but it was a feeling that I could still cut things, you know. My, now my worry is my colored pencil collection, which most of which I buy in the United States because they're my favorite. And, and the other pencils I can't, sorry? Which Please. brand is that? Prismacolor. Okay, and now I know what uh, to get you. Uh, I, I'm running <laughs> out of certain, I've been drawing drawings and I'm running out of certain colors. I'm nervous. Will I have to change my whole color scheme of, of my next drawings? Or can I manage, can I, you know, can I, so I'm, I've been, I've become an, uh, never before I have a little thing to hold the pen and they got down to that length of crayon to keep the color going. Um, and the lockdown, and then I'm worrying that I'm gonna, I start to worry if I'm gonna, I managed to get somebody to send me some paper, uh, etc. So it's it's that, it's the sort of practicality, meaning, it's really a sort of admission of weakness. You really are trying to carry on without being interfered with. But of course you are being interfered with. And then the other thing that one dearly misses is, you know, having a, few drinks with people we did we did manage to go around to some friends uh and their very 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 large garden much larger than ours uh, and we sat about 10 feet away from each other if not more 
very far away from each other. It was a very, very big garden. And then the thunderstorm came <laughs> and we had to pack it in. So we're, we're kind of, you know, I think it's sort of trying to cling on to rather than, you know, everybody says now everything will change and people will change. We've seen in England, my, my hometown Bournemouth had half a million people descending on its beach yesterday. Half a million, which is a lot of people, you know, like three times yeah. the size of the town whatever and um really scary stuff and people we yell and i when we walk around the streets here we're almost the only people wearing masks so that scares me that 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 uh, like myself everybody wants they're not going to make as many adjustments as we would like morally quote unquote for them to do that that concerns me even though i'm as bad myself i don't want to make concessions either so I think there's a lot of moral high ground being talked about about it, most of which is probably bullshit, actually. Sorry to be negative on that. I think what's been very great this evening is, is this lunchtime, whatever, has been your tremendous response, I think, to every question asked, to every nuance. You have a, you have a creative reply. You know, you're not just a clever girl, but you're actually you're thinking on your feet all the time. And that shows in the buildings, but it shows in you personally. And you do it with a, a certain, shall I, dare I use the word charm, with an understanding. I imagine, I was going to ask you all about teaching, but it, we've gone on a long time. Uh, I would put money on the fact that you're a very good teacher. I, I just might knows after many years knowing about these things i would say okay we don't need to ask that question clearly you are clearly I, you know I wish, what gets people going i think i think um i wish i would have had you as one of my professors um I, you know i try teaching i try to be better and better but i i think there's some people that are just amazing oh, but i think what, what sorry i could take a <laughs> what is interesting is that you are Full on a professional, and yet you're also interested in teaching. Bother you don't have to traipse over to Boston every few days, whatever it is. You know, if you don't have you, unless you want to, you know, you don't need to get off on the fact you teach at Harvard, you, you, you you're beyond that, but you do. And I think there's in, in this country, there's a terrible gap between people who do quantities of good building, or even quantities of any building, and the people who occupy architecture schools. Most of the people in architecture schools might have done a small extension or a couple of art installations. Now that's not to put down extensions, art installations, but there are a lot of talented people out there building, and either their office doesn't want them to teach, or the school will only take them to teach if they do a lot of administrative bullshit. Somehow, mm. the old European tradition that her professor was a working architect around the corner and his or her assistants were also partly mm. in the school, partly doing the it's, it's sort of frowned upon in the UK. I don't know how, it's a little bit more possible in the States, but not enough. Mm. Teachings become a kind of <clears throat> detached mm. thing, and the profession, which we were talking about this morning with Wang Chu, is a detached thing. Yeah. So that's a, no, a whole hobby house. I think <clears throat> next time we meet, which I hope is in the flesh, we can talk about that one. Yeah, that would Thank be. And, and we're going to have, I think, now two or three months break before the autumn season of these chats they're going to go on we're going to start with a, a humdinger on the first day of the Bartlett term with, i can't announce who because i don't know who i got some people in mind and we're going to carry on through right through because uh, i'm enjoying it a lot of other people seem to be enjoying it and it's uh, a way of looking up friends and uh, getting to know them better.
yeah, if, if, if nothing else, I think that's that's great too. So Jeannie, yeah. thank you for being our uh, summer queen of the summer. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it's now gone dark and is about to thunderstorm, I think. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Really, thank you guys. Um, so yeah, this um, this as Peter says, this concludes our, our summer term at the Bartlett School of Architecture. We'd just like to say congratulations to all the students who have survived um, this very intense period of lockdown and managed to hand in, um, and to our first years who will be handing in on Tuesday. So a huge congratulations to them and also to all other students across the schools across the globe. Um, thank you very much for watching on YouTube. We've had three events over the last three weeks. So we started off with Martin Hook and Flo Watson at RMIT and Thomas Mann in um, Los Angeles of Morphosis. Then we went the next week, um, Neil Denari in Los Angeles. Last time we were speaking to Sue Fujimoto and Elizabeth Diller in New York. And then today we've been speaking to Wang Xu and Lu Wengyu in the morning in um, Hanzhou at the China Academy of Arts. Um, and then the pleasure to finish with you, Jeannie Gang, um, in Chicago. So we'd like to say a huge thank you. Um, and please tune in again. So Friday, the 2nd of October, we will be continuing the series of Around the World in Eight Hours with uh, Peter Cook. And these are being live streamed on YouTube. Um, and pleasure that all of our friends and um, students have joined us in the, in the Zoom. So thank you all. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye, Presso.